So welcome everyone. This is uh, a Beam Exchange Grab the Mic webinar. Uh, my name is Mike Albu. I am the director of the Beam Exchange, which is a global platform for information exchange, knowledge sharing about market systems development and its application. And today I'm very pleased to say that the, the heavy lifting is going to be done by my colleague, Mike Klassen, who is uh, a market systems specialist with the Beam Exchange. Um, and he will be uh, introducing our three speakers, uh, Nina Witz-Simmons, who's CEO of Prisma in Indonesia, uh, Paul Ndungu, who's a senior HR manager for Gatsby Africa, based in uh, Nairobi in Kenya, and uh, Fernando Martinez, a technical officer on SME development at ILO. And they're all gonna be talking about how their organizations have in different ways in the last few years applied the MSD competency framework, which is one of our um, resources on the Beam Exchange, um, which I hope you're familiar with. So I'm going to stop talking and hand over to Mike Klassen, who's going to be your moderator, since he is one of the main authors of the MSD competency framework, has done more work than me on putting it together. And he's been very involved in supporting these organisations, these three organisations to apply the framework. So, um, Mike, take it away. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, thanks, Mike, and, and welcome, everybody. Uh, really looking forward to this, to this conversation. So I'm really just going to take a minute or two uh, to, to set the scene. Um, it's been over five years since we launched the, the competency framework, which is just scary how, how time flies. Um, and so the, the first thing I want to do is, for those that aren't familiar, I think we'll pop the link and my colleague Isabel may have already in the chat if you want to just pull it open. I mean, it's um, it's a labyrinth. <laughs> There's a lot of different holes you can go down. But at the essence, what I'm showing on screen here, this is the, the core of the competency framework. These are the, the 17 competencies that through a really interesting process of Kind of interview and feedback and exchange with, with a number of industry stakeholders we came out with. I'm not going to read through every one of them, but you can you know see that we've kind of grouped them into these three groups. The, the first one around analysis and insight, really at the core of what makes the MSD approach different is that analytical kind of digging deep into system dynamics, um, root causes, what's shaping behavior of market actors of market systems. Um, and so there's a lot under that under that group. The, the second group around the actual putting into practice of, of change processes. So kind of loosely called it intervention delivery, um, your entry points, kind of interpreting information, making decisions, you know, negotiating, partnering with, with different market actors, um, how that all leads up to a broader change in the market system. And then crucially, this, this third group um, around, you know, teamwork and interaction and, and these absolutely kind of crucial competencies and the, the skills that, that underpin them around relationship building, facilitation, et cetera. So, I mean, feel free in your own time to, to geek out and have a deep dive. You click on any one of those um, and it gives you a lot more information about defining it, giving examples, kind of interesting kind of links and resources. And then there's a whole other layer to it around how would you uh, teach or develop that competency with different kind of options, um, kind of in situ training, mentoring, et cetera. Um, also, how would you assess it? And then we've later added some more guidance on some particular use cases. And when we ran a web webinar, I think it was four years ago in 2019, we were spotlighting some of those like early adopters um, that were applying it, particularly to hiring process, even for an individual role. We've got this key position coming up in our program team or in our country office or in our HQ. We want to be competency driven in who we hire, and so that you know we, we were spotlighting that kind of um, emphasis. Today we're we're in a different place, um, and so that's part of what's exciting about this webinar. And just to give a high level, the the three different contributions, and then I'll I'll hand over uh, to Nina to take us away. But what we're going to hear is three different examples that are applying the competency framework kind of at a wider scale. So we're going to start off uh, with Prisma which is a large, well-known and long-running MSD program um, that's using the competency framework, particularly for large cohorts of staff hiring, this big batch hiring process, um, and then also performance management. So that's a single but quite large MSD program that can apply it at the program level. 
Then we'll hear from Paul at Gatsby, where we're actually looking at an entire organization. So Gatsby being a small foundation, applying MSD in various projects, and they're using the competency framework for, for many different aspects, recruitment, performance appraisal, also for learning. Uh, and then this final example, we'll hear from Fernando at the ILO, you know, using the, the competency framework as part of a really interesting intensive assessment process where they're actually certifying the competencies of consultants and others, um, and that's specifically in, in humanitarian context. So we've got three different examples um, to share with you. Without much further ado, I'll, I'll pass it over to uh, Nina uh, to kick things off, and, and please comment in the chat and, and do pose your questions as you go. Uh, looking forward to the discussion. Over to you, Nina. Great. Thanks, everyone. Um, as I'll just share my screen. Right, so um, as um, Mike let you know, I'm Nina Fitzsimons. I'm the um, CEO or team leader of Prisma. So just to give you a little bit of um, context, um, Prisma is a large MSC program. We're based in Indonesia. So I'm coming to you tonight um, from Surabaya. We're a 10 year um, investment that's funded by the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. So the Australian government working in together. Nina, with yes. Sorry to cut you off. We've got it's flipped back on the view. So if you right, just go to display let settings. Me just swap that. Has that worked for you now? Perfect. You're good to go. Great. Thank you. Um, so yes, we're a 10 year investment. We work primarily in rural development, so in agriculture. Um, to date, we've reached 1.2 million um, small holding, um, smallholder farming households. So that's around 3 million farmers. Just to give you an idea, our budget is 200 million. We have 150 um, staff members. The majority of those are local staff. And um, importantly, when we first started um, nine years ago, there were no donor funded MSD programs in Indonesia. And so there was no domestic pool of um, MSD specialists to, um, to pull from. And so that is why we started our batch recruitment, as Mike mentioned. So when we first started our recruitment, we used this cohort recruitment. Um, this was based um, on the fact that we actually recruited new uh, university um, candidates, so new graduates. The reason for that strategy, and I, I noticed from a lot of the MSD literature that this is something that's used in other programs, it's because um, new graduates can be easily trained, they can be molded, they're um, highly enthusiastic, um, but they also don't come with any direct delivery, delivery experience. So it didn't give much to go on in terms of um, recruitment. So what we used was um, people's grade point average and also what university they went to. Um, and then when we actually got into the cohort um, uh, weekend, the recruitment day, it was mainly around business acumen, but also doing lots of psychometric testing. Now, the issues with this approach is that it didn't actually lead to much diversity within the team. And there was also, particularly with psychometric testing, no correlation between high scores in the psychometric testing and then high performing staff. Um, it was also very difficult with this strategy to actually build middle management or senior management capacity because by the time we trained people, they were right pickings for the, the, for the private sector. Also, our performance assessment process um, at that time was um, based on KPIs. This was because our um, headquarter organization used KPIs and we were required to adopt that, um, adopt that system. Um, but as we know with MSD programs, they're complex. Um, some sectors for us, some agricultural sectors were easier than others. And you know, some required a higher level of trial and error. Um, and of course, because we had a system that was based on KPIs for performance, it didn't account for those complexities. And um, ultimately what this did is it, it created competition between teams, which actually eroded sharing between teams and led to siloed work. Um, and also because you know, it was based on KPIs on outputs and outcomes that actually meant that 
even though we encourage um, failure within MSD programs, or at least we know that it's going to happen because of the high level of um, trial and error, it actually meant that there was a fear of failure, which was exactly opposite of what we wanted. So after some time, we uh, intuitively realized that we would need to go to a competency-based process. And luckily in 2018, Beam Exchange had already developed their competency framework, which we borrowed heavily from. Um, and so when we changed from our um, initial system, what we did is that for each job description within or for each job within the program, we actually identified around five key competencies um, for recruitment. And then for the batch recruitment itself, we actually developed case scenarios that were um, specific to core competencies based on each of the positions. Um, and we also did our interview process, which was also based on core competencies, which meant that you could actually narrow down the questions and you didn't get stupid questions or not really helpful questions like, you know, what do you consider your key strengths, um, which don't really tell you much. Um, so what we did in both of those processes was to actually develop um, assessment notes to provide for objective assessment because what we weren't looking at was for technically correct questions, but actually we were looking for um, people who had good systems thinking, good analysis, good, um, you were able to pull information and synthesize it quite quickly. So it didn't matter if the answer was wrong, as long as um, we could see potential in the competencies. And then for performance assessment, we got rid of the KPIs and we went to competency-based analysis. And what this enabled us to do is actually to do um, gap analysis, which enabled us to um, develop better uh, capacity building plans for staff. So this actually did lead to an improvement in our capacity development for staff. Um, so we actually do a four week induction program, which is essentially a four week MSD training program. And again, we did this based on the core competencies and we did pre and post assessments, which were also competency based, which again enabled us to do good gap analysis in terms of what competency staff needed training in. And we developed a, a 12 month uh, capacity development plan um, specifically to address areas where there were core competencies across um, the board. So if we look at the key learnings in using our um, competency-based framework, I think you know, this is the same for, for all programs. It's that talent is really a vital ingredient for a successful program. And what we realized very early on is that sectoral specialization or technical skills in agriculture will, were actually less important than the key attributes necessary for systems thinking. And that's where um, adopting the uh, a competency based framework really helped. The other thing which we learned because we didn't do this is that you need to get it right from the start. So that's the benefit of actually using the beam exchange competency framework is that you know there's a good framework there for you to build on. Um, when we started to do it, we, you know, while we intuitively knew we didn't do a very good job. Um, and so um, staff actually developed fatigue, which doesn't create enthusiasm for the next change. We also realized that you had to pick and choose carefully um, the um, competencies. If you go into the competency framework, everyone you think, yes, yes, we need this, we need this. Um, but we found that it was much easier to identify five key or five or six key competencies per position. Um, and then that actually made the assessment process and also the appraisal process a lot smoother. And then gap analysis can be done to identify weaknesses in other competencies. The other thing we learned is that it's much better to work on whole and not just the part. So when we first started, we only looked at recruitment and then we realized that there was a benefit in actually incorporating a competency framework throughout the whole um, staff development process, which we've ended up doing. 
Um, and one which is particularly important to me, um, being a team leader and not necessarily being um, a highly specialised technical team leader, is that Group C, which Mike um, introduced us to earlier, which is actually the competencies around relationship building, facilitation, communication, influence and self-learning, that's actually critical for good team management. So particularly on a program like ours, where we were building up um, key uh, competency in MSD in um, you know, a group of staff that didn't have these, that really you have to remember that the C in group C competencies is actually critical. And if you do have a localization agenda, this is one that um, you should include, particularly in um, staff management positions. And um, with that, I'll hand it um, back over to Mike. Thank you very much, everyone. Yeah, thanks, Nina. Um, we'll, we'll jump straight ahead with, with Paul's presentation. So you can go ahead and, and share your screen, Paul, and take us take us away into Gatsby land. Welcome to Gatsby land, as Mike has called it. I hope you can see my screens and that I'm clear. This, this go ahead, Paul. Me. Yep, great. Uh, hello everyone, uh, Paul Ndungo working for Gatsby, welcoming you from Arene, Nairobi, uh, on how we've applied the MSD competency framework to our organization. So for us, the challenge uh, was that we had transitioned from being a funder to a funder implementer. And because this, this was possible because we are a small private foundation and we have been challenged to actually be unique and innovative in how we can achieve meaningful change. So transitioning from a funder to an implementer in around the year 2016 uh, made us realize that it was difficult to get ready talent uh, for what we wanted to do, uh, which is sector transformation, which in this case is it's market systems development, but with some uh, peculiarities around how we choose the sectors we work in. And so we had to deal with the question of how to address the, the entire value chain of getting uh, the resource we needed from selection to development, how we manage performance and doing that systematically. And it was then understood that rolling out a competency framework was going to help us uh, achieve that. And that was in the context of uh, an organization with about 150 staff uh, spread between Kenya, UK and, and Tanzania and running a, a diverse portfolio of sector programs, uh, which yeah, keep changing, but currently we have tea, aquaculture, agricultural inputs, commercial forestry, livestock, and textile and apparel, and also water. Some of them uh, mostly uh, in some countries, but some spreading across the uh, Kenya and Tanzania. And so with that challenge, embarking on uh, rolling out a competency framework, we I'm trying to move my slides here now. Let me see. Yes, so we embarked on applying uh, competency framework and I captured two ideas here. First, the areas in which we have applied the competency framework and also one thing we had to do in order to make it successful and that is a staged rollout. So I carry those two ideas here together. So as you can see, we've applied the competency framework to personal uh, development for our staff. We've applied it in recruitment and selection of staff and also in performance management and looking forward to do an organization-wide strategic application where we will uh, be doing workforce planning and then linking that to recognition and reward. And so the idea about the state rollout came out because we realized just the, the change management uh, challenge, you know, as, as the organization started off and then had to transition to using a, a competency-based approach. And so having developed the competency framework uh, 2019, we started by just using it for personal development planning, where we use the language in PDPs, uh, where staff listed the competencies they needed to develop. And then a year on, we started using it in our job descriptions, where in each job descriptions, the section on uh, what is required, it featured the competencies based on our competency framework. And from last year, we had a full-blown application 
application to uh, performance management, where staff were setting objectives, where they listed both the key activities to deliver on and the necessary competencies they need to deliver on those uh, uh, key activities. And besides that, it's also listing which objectives, which competencies they need to work on to develop themselves in. And going forward, uh, we are going to be doing an organization-wide uh, competency assessment, which we shall be using for workforce planning and reward. So that's in terms of the usage. And uh, then moving on to what we encountered as we went along, I just highlight uh, three key challenges that uh, I'll also mention how we went about addressing them. Uh, so the first one is, the, the idea of developing a competency framework and involving the different people in the organization led to people coming in with different thoughts and understanding on what competencies really matter. And I guess for every organization, uh, it has to decide what, what competencies really matter. And this included also whether all as aspects needed for for instance, understanding the people we need can be covered in competencies. And we are able to say not quite there are elements that are personal attributes that may not be uh, competencies. And there was quite a bit of back and forth on that. And how did we make headway in that? It was greatly helped by having uh, the BIM competency and uh, the conversations that I was able to have with Mike. Uh, and we were able to match uh, what we had laid out in the beam, and that was very helpful both for the competencies and the language, uh, because it's also a matter of language. How do you describe a competency? But we also did look at other frameworks, the SHL, Conferry, CIPD, and a couple of others, and that helped us to come up with something that was fairly acceptable. And then in selecting, we've had times when at the beginning we had many and then narrowed them down to fewer. And here we relied on linking the selected competencies to our strategic objectives. So that was helpful. The other general challenge we encountered is just the fact that if you have a competency for the entire organization, it can be a bulky document. I don't think there's a way to escape that, especially when you take it down to the level of uh, descriptors of how you might assess that. And, it's important for people to get their head around that document in order for them to be able to use it. And for that, we basically focused on very uh, detailed and repeated training. And then the stage rollout that I showed enabled people to use it in bits and pieces, and that allowed people to enter into it uh, gently. And also we did realize there was all this push to keep changing uh, and getting better and better at it. But at some point we say, no, we will freeze it and run for two years on exactly the same, collecting feedback and then adapting. So that was very helpful because it enabled people to first accept this is a framework and this is uh, what we work with. And we have then adapted and uh, gotten feedback from people and used that. And finally, because we are using it for the entire organization, you can imagine there's a big difference between uh, how competencies would look like for uh, the ops team versus the programs team. And that has led us to work from one uh, competency framework to one that is divided into core competencies that are applicable for everyone, and then role-specific competencies that are divided by the various uh, job families that we have in, in Gatsby, Africa. And so those are some of the challenges and uh, yeah, how far we've got. And as we said, going forward, we are looking to use it system systematically to look at all organizational processes. And I guess we are looking forward to learning more and more uh, from others as we go on with this. So thank you. And I hand over now to Nina Fernando. I may stop sharing here. Perfect, thanks, Paul. You can take us away, Fernando. All right, hello, everyone. Can you see and hear me, I guess? Yes, no? Yes and yes. All right. Uh, well, thanks for the invite. And, and it's cool to see so many friends and colleagues in the, in the, in the participant list. So hey, everyone. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll quickly go uh, to show how we imp uh, adopted MSD competencies uh, in, in a particular challenge that we have and how we continue doing it. Um, 
so let's let me start by that. What was the challenge? Um, the, the challenge was uh, we have this uh, adaptation of market systems development to humanitarian development context, in particular to context of forced displacement that we call AIMS, which is our approach to inclusive market systems. Please look it up. Um, and uh, we had a, a growing demand of, of projects in the region, in Latin America in particular. Um, and uh, we had low capacity that we have identified of consultants and people to work with in the region to, 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 to develop these this, uh, programs, projects, assessments, et cetera. So that's how we started. The, that was our, our, our challenge and our problem. So based on that, um, we decided to, to run a, a consultant certification uh, in where we would train consultants in, in our methodology, how to, to do, in particular, we had, uh, we were looking for analysts. So people who will help us to develop a market system assessments um, and design market-based interventions. So uh, the, 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 the configuration of the course uh, was uh, funded by like six or seven countries in the ILO, which different projects. Uh, and they were chipping in, um, uh, consultants uh, that they identified in their countries, and we were taking those consultants and training them. And at the end, uh, we um, assessed them, and some of them got certified, and some of them didn't get certified. That's in a nutshell what we did. Uh, our competency framework. Uh, if you remember the big uh, slide that Mike shared at the beginning, and he had a bunch of A, one, two, three, blah. So uh, we use six of those. Uh, the six that you see here. Um, but yeah, if you have any specific questions about these competencies, Mike or me or any of, of us would be uh, helpful uh, and we would be able to, to, to share specific information on competencies. But I want to, I want to focus on, on our experience uh, generally. Um, so we did this, we found uh, it was like 30 um, uh, consultants and we ended up certifying, I'd say like, 14, 16, maybe 17 uh, consultants. Uh, in that process, uh, we, a couple of, of, of let's say, uh, reflections no? and, and, and learning experiences. One is assessing reports versus assessing presentations. So as part of the, of the certification, the consultants needed to go and do a, an MSD assessment, an MSA, um, and then they would have to present it to us. No? So the reports, um, in some cases, the competencies that we were assessing in the report, we were not be able to assess it in the presentations or sometimes it was the opposite, no? Sometimes in the presentation, the person looked very, very confident, uh, but in, and let's say those competencies were uh, evident in those presentations, but when assessing reports, it was, maybe it, it didn't. So of course, in a lot of cases, it, it, it showed in both, but when it didn't, uh, we were very, um, we're very confused of, of, of why this could be. We have many theories. A lot of these reports were uh, constructed by uh, different consultants at the same time uh, in groups of consultants. Uh, also, some consultants have capacity to write in a way that others don't, and that's maybe not measurable in the set of competencies, which takes me to the second uh, challenge and learning experience, which is uh, assessing some intangibles, or I wouldn't say intangibles, but more things that are not in the, in the framework of the competencies. Um, so of course, a lot of uh, consultants that were super committed to the process or that um, were, um, let's say, involved in projects uh, in where this was part of their job, they did a better job than, 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 than consultants that didn't. So that's something that uh, maybe uh, it's more, um, talks more about the selection process of the candidates, which is my third point. So in our case, to, 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 to generate capacity and certificate competencies, the selection process of candidates was crucial. So in where we had very competitive uh, races of candidates to, to be selected, the output was much, much better than in countries in where the pool of candidates was smaller to choose from. Um, so of course, you know, the, the, the best, the better your talent or the more aligned your talent to your competencies are at the beginning, the, the best uh, out, outputs you're going to get. I'm not discovering anything here, no? Um, one thing, it, it takes some time to master assessing competencies. Uh, we were three people assessing competencies. And uh, I'll have to say, definitely, the you get a hang of it by the second, third, or fourth time that you're listening to a presentation. It's easier to, 
to see where these competencies are popping and where the, the candidate is evidencing, showing some of those competencies. And when at, at the beginning, when you don't have the framework in your mind and you're not be able to navigate through it almost instinctively, uh, you, I, sometimes you might not give candidates a chance to evidence competencies, even if they haven't. But by the third, fourth, fifth candidate, you could, you could, you know which questions to ask in order to check if that candidate had the competency or not. Um, so you were more intentional with that uh, as time uh, went by. Uh, my fifth uh, 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 learning experience here is competencies have to be culturally adapted. Um, I don't know if my name gave it away, but I'm, I'm Latino, I'm, I'm Colombian. Um, and uh, I, don't, I don't know if you work with a lot of Latinos, but knowledge synthesis is not our thing. You know, We like to talk, we like to, to expand, we like to, take, we like to paint a picture, and then we deliver a message. And so for example, knowledge synthesis was very, very hard for us to measure. Like literally no candidates st uh, stuck to the time allotted uh, for their presentations. Uh, and almost all candidates also expand more than they should have in the, in the reports. So more than the, the, the pages that we gave them. And uh, so of course, uh, this exercise would have been very, very different uh, where Nina is working or where Paul is working or where Mike uh, is working. Uh, so it's important for you also to understand who you're assessing. In this case, it was three Latinos uh, assessing other Latinos. So I think it was, it was okay. But if that disparity happens, then, then you might want to check that. Um, lastly, uh, we're still running uh, uh, competency-based uh, certifi certifications um, in the ILO, and uh, particularly the uh, uh, ITC ILO have, has taken uh, this um, model and they've replicated, they've replicated like I think three times in a row for their uh, for our VCD uh, certification process and for our AIM certification process as well. So yeah, we've we've had we've we've learned uh, since then. So yeah, if you have any questions, please happy to to go and answer. Yeah, fantastic. Um, thanks, thanks so much, Fernando. Um, maybe if you want to just stop sharing your screen. Um, we'll move into more of a conversation Q and A here. I mean, looking at uh, looking at the participant list, there's lots of friendly faces. So please, um, you know, come forth with your with your questions, also your comments. It could be something that somebody said that just kind of caught your interest that you wanted to to reinforce. Officially, we've just got the one question um, from Anna in the Q and A box, um, and I know Nina, you've already given an amazingly detailed kind of written answer, but let's. Let's have a conversation about it. I mean, Anna's question is, it's to Nina, but we could see if others um, on the panel want to jump in. Kind of an example or two of the questions you asked. I think this is really important, getting getting concrete around what it looks like. How would you even, how would you know you're asking a competency-based question based on an example? Um, so uh, maybe you don't have to read out your whole uh, spiel there, Nina, but if you want to talk about an example, and I like the way in what you wrote, you're kind of saying, Here's the question, but here's what's behind it. And I think that gets to Fernando's point too about learning how to assess competency. It is actually that's a learning process there. So um over to you, Nina, just to, to share some yeah, thoughts. So what we did is before we did the competency-based questions, our questions were kind of general HR questions that you'd get in any interview. Um, but what we found is that you get very generic answers, and then it's also very subjective. Um, so what we realized is that if we actually could develop questions around the competencies and um, the beam exchange, um, the competency framework is actually really great because it actually goes through um, some example questions. For us, we found that we needed to tailor those a little bit more and also what, um, you know, Fernando said, it had to be culturally um, specific also for Indonesia. Um, and so we found that we did have to ask a lot of questions around system analysis and systems thinking, critical um, thinking. So we did scenario based questions, a lot of scenario based questions, and then it wasn't about getting a technically correct answer, it was just to see the thought process. So I've provided one of those answers and then um, that's kind of a little bit from our assessment notes, the kind of things we would train our assessors, our interviewer, interviewers um, to do, because it's about being able to pick up or 
even if the answer is incorrect, it's to be able to pick up a thought process or to, to see a thought process happening. Um, and uh, so I've given one example, but the, the great thing is that the competency framework actually provides um, some direction as well. Um, Fernando um, or Paul, did you have anything to add? Maybe a comment on that. What we found in our foray into role specific areas was that the competencies helped us to redefine the how of what anyone is doing. And so you think about you doing MEL, the competency thinking helps you to think about how would a high performing MEL, you know, staff be doing, you know, is it data collection, is it presentation, and that uh, phrasing then, it can be applied to anything, but it gives you that opportunity to think about how would a high performing person in this area or doing these kinds of uh, things uh, be, be, be assessed, for instance, for performance, and that therefore makes it quite you know, it lends itself to being applied in the various areas. And that's what we've done as we went into the role specific uh, competency def definition. Yeah, thanks, Paul. I mean, in a way, you're, I think, picking up on Nasir's question from the chat, kind of getting into how do you how do you differentiate by by role type? Um, maybe just anything, Fernando, you want to add in response to Anna's question, kind of just examples. I mean, in a sense, kind of your presentation in your case is this kind of real deep dive on assessment. Um, are there particular questions that you found helpful to tease out certain competencies or anything else you want to say about um, kind of the, the types of scenarios um, or examples you're asking people to respond to kind of in the assessment? Um, any kind of secret, secret sauce questions that you found really drew people out on things that'd be really helpful. Yeah, uh, I'm gonna disappoint you there with secret sauce, but I'll, I'll do my best with, uh, with with some salt and pepper. Uh, I guess uh, that's what I was saying before, like uh, at the beginning when you're, because the Beam Exchange, uh, the framework, it's pretty good. If you look at the competencies, I just showed the competencies, but then they tell you how to how to evidence, how, how can a candidate is evidencing those competencies? And uh, so for example, behavioral insight, uh, it, 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 it goes a little bit into uh, someone understanding the motivations of different actors within uh, market systems, right? Um, who's willing to pay, who's willing to do what, et cetera. Uh, so for example, if you start by um, listening to a candidate and they're not gonna go competency by competency no, in, in, in their presentation, they're gonna say a bunch of stuff and you're going to have your, let's say your mental bingo of competencies and you're gonna start start identifying, ah, okay, he's, he or she said this, he or she said that, they said that, et cetera, no? So after a, after a while, you become a bit of an expert in, in saying, oh, he or she hasn't mentioned this or he or she hasn't mentioned that. So you also can give the candidate a, 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 a possibility or a chance to, to expand on something with a question, no? And of course you can, you, you can be smart in not leading with the question, but saying, I don't know, um, which actors did you find in the system that were willing to take whatever, no? And then with that question, you see the person uh, respond through the competency that you're assessing that is behavioral insight in this case, for example. Um, so let's say that's, just, that's, what I'm, that's what I mean that at the beginning, it, it's, it's a bit hard. It takes a bit of practice. I would suggest to, even if it's silly, to do a couple of, of mock rounds, just to have the mental bingo in your head. And then when, when, when you see a candidate, you are able to, to pinpoint where, 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 where the, yeah, the competencies are being evidenced. Yeah, no, thanks. Thanks a lot, Fernando. I mean, I'll, I'll post a link in a minute. I think one of the, the challenges here is like, you can have good starting interview questions but the filters of what you're looking for, to, if that's displaying competencies or not. And we've got a kind of section of guidance around interviewing, particularly on the hiring processes, because so much of it is actually about what you're listening for and how you're asking follow-up questions to probe people's thinking. Did they, it's not just, did they say the right words, but did they have the right thought process? And I think, you know, Nina really covered that nicely in, in her presentation about the technical answer, not as important as, as, as the thought process. 
which uh -huh. just to say there, Mike, which is a bit different when you are, let's say, reading an assessment or when you're, someone is presenting you an assessment and you're trying to see if the competencies are there, no? So, of course, you want to see the technical assessment that is being presented to you and you want to see how it is, but at the same time, you're looking at the competencies of the person. So maybe something is not written there, but if you ask the question, the person knows that it's not written there. Uh, so it's it's in a way it's giving you that, that the person has the competency. It's just that they didn't have the chance to research that or something like that, you know. Uh, so it's it's a bit ch tricky when you don't control the flow of the presentation. Even if you give candidates, okay, this is the way it's going to go. The competencies are not going to be evidence in that linear way of the of the technical uh, presentation that you're going to receive. If, if that makes sense. Anyway, so that's just a little bit of um, added fun yeah, to the process. Yeah, thanks. And, and I will say that when we built the original framework, we don't actually have a space where we're capturing insights on how to do written assessments. We kind of assumed you'd be doing straight up interview questions. You'd be giving people cases to respond to kind of verbally in an interview or maybe with a bit of prep, or you'd be observing them actually doing the work because they're hired and they're on a program. So I think it's something for us to think about in learning from how you all are taking this up is that the written assessment, and we've, we've seen other organizations mention that too. So um, thanks for, for shining a light there. A couple of new interesting questions coming in through the chat. I'm wondering if uh, Leah or Leah, R Richard or Richard from the ILO, are you, are you able to unmute and share your question? I think it's uh, really poignant and um, would love to, to just hear it in your voice. And sorry, Anne, I didn't give you that chance. Um, moderator learning here. Not seeing an unmute option. There we go. Hi, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Uh, yes. So I was thinking, uh, when you're hiring a new team and you've got you know limited staff, implementing staff, and you're looking at these 17 competencies, um, sometimes it can be hard to know which ones to narrow down to. And I see that the framework says you know to narrow down three to five core competencies. So I thought it would be really great to hear from from uh, Nina and Paul and, and Fernando um, if you had any experience to share of moments where you faced that challenge or things that worked for you uh, or how you address them basically and and something that could be could be useful uh, for us as we hire teams in the future. Thank you. Maybe I could just begin by commenting about the. Uh, the thinking about core competencies, where we look at basically what is in the C section of the, the BIM exchange that falls by the vision of core competencies. And we do focus on that in terms of understanding how somebody things, how they interact with people, their communication. And so our prioritization is around we want you to come to Gatsby Africa. We know these are core. We seek to influence people. So your communication and relationship building is, is very key. And so there we basically look at what is most important to us. And I think, as I mentioned, strategic connection to what the organization wants to do. And as much as all of them have some place to play, play we prioritize and say, what is it that we must get? And for us as Gatsby, relationship building is absolutely key. So we, we do focus on, on that uh, communication. And then, yeah, the rest can fall in as uh, good to have. Yeah, just a brief comment. Yeah, I think for us, the, the key is that form follows function. And so for us, you know, we you also need to look at the level of the staff member coming in, and that will also help you determine um, if you just look at the project cycle, um, determine where that person will sit in that project cycle. And then that will also help you um, determine which core competencies are key. So I think form follows function and also the how. And I think um, Fernando mentioned that earlier. It's about, or maybe it was Paul, sorry, I can't remember um, who, but it's about what you anticipate this person um, doing and how they will do it. And then that will help you. And I think there was also another question on um, how do you integrate this approach into MEL? So it doesn't matter what job description, because we also use these core competencies for our operational staff as well. Um, so all of these core competencies can be adjusted actually um, to any um, any position within an MSD program because ultimately you need to have everyone, um, even the operational staff in 
um, also thinking in an MSD way. And just yeah, the idea, yeah, that the competence is really helping to think about the how of doing whatever it is that unites the whole organization together lends itself to what Janina is saying that you can actually apply it across the board. It's, it's helping you to clearly delineate the how of doing whatever it is a person does. I think uh, for in our, in our case also, what was important was what competencies we, do we have internally as a team and what competencies we need to, to, to hire. So for example, in our case, uh, we focus on competencies uh, on, on analysis. So basically analysts and people who can design things. And we didn't focus, for example, in people that could do market facilitation, for example. Uh, and we focused, we, we chose those competencies based on that. So that's an, another thing that you can do is base, see who, who in your team has what in the team that you're, that's, that you're hiring for and what competencies are needed and then focusing on those ones. I think focusing is better than just trying to measure them all, I think. Uh, it was hard enough uh, in, in our case uh, to focus on, on those, but yeah, that's just from my, our experience. Thanks. And I would just kind of chime in on that, that last point around, um, you know, sometimes we can focus so much on, on the individual, um, but really that kind of blend of mix across a team. And so in, if you're talking, Leah, about a new small team, um, then actually, I mean, ideally you don't have to hire them all at once. You could actually space it out a little bit because depending on who you hire first, what their skills, it may actually change what you're looking for in, in, in the next person. This has been a really recurring theme, this kind of ongoing work on, on leadership and competencies of team leaders is that it's kind of an iterative process. I mean, what team leader you need depends on what team and what the team skills depend a bit on the team leader. And I think the smaller the program, the more that's the case. And when you're looking at really large programs like the one that, that Nina's leading, it's, it's a little bit different because you've got, you're big enough that you can have more specialization. But if you're, if you're talking about a team of five or even under 10, then you kind of want the team leader kind of having to be in there doing more of the analytical work, more of the partnership work. Um, and so again, if, if that person's hired, then thinking about what do you need to complement them? What, what strengths do they already have? So uh, th thanks panel. That was a, Really nice kind of rounded answer. We've got a couple more coming in here. Um, anonymous attendee, which maybe is hard to unmute, um, but I'll just read this question. I think it's good because we've just talked a bit about the recruitment side, but this question is saying, how would you advise to use the framework to inform capacity building planning for a team that's already place, already in place, specifically that are just beginning to take up MSD um, as, a, as a new way of programming? I'm wondering if we go to you first on this, Paul, um, because I know as per your stages rollout that, that, that Gatsby's in a, in a way, in some senses, you kind of started with the developmental PDP kind of, you know, targeting individuals, but also teams. So your thoughts on this question, and maybe we'll hear from one other, and then, and then we'll go to Merton's question before we close. Yes. So it begins with once, once it's accepted that we, we, these competencies are the most important, then a conversation around with each person around what they are good at, where they are at with each of them. And so we ended up with uh, an individual sitting with their line manager and discussing what of the required uh, descriptors or the, the way they would demonstrate that, which of those are they able to demonstrate. And so there was a bit of mapping in terms of what is needed versus what you currently have, and then agreeing on, therefore, these are the areas we need to bridge the gaps. And then that is also linked with the work deliverables, where it starts with, this is what we are going to be working with you to deliver, uh, which competences are going to be key, and then at what level are you uh, with the various ones of them. And that's a conversation that then gets captured, the gap is observed, and then you go ahead to look for ways to bridge the gap where there are, there are gaps. And we've done a couple of things, for instance, enrolled people on the LinkedIn learning uh, platform where they can then go in and find uh, courses that can help them bridge some of those gaps uh, among other ways of bridging some of the gaps. Nina, do you want to ch chime in here too? I know that was part of your presentation, but you didn't get into the, the details. Like what yeah, does that think... targeted capacity development look like for you, for you folks? Yeah, so... Actually, at the beginning, it's quite easy because you can do it, particularly if it's a team that doesn't have, and 
like you say um, that um, it was for a program where you're using MSD um, as a new way of programming. So that was the same for us. So it's actually easy at the beginning and then you become more specialized as the program goes along. Um, so mapping is important, but what we also found is that part some most of these core competencies you can't do through training it's usually on the job training that we do so um what we did is that we did a lot of mentorship um and so for example the expats on the program um while they were also there to drive um the strategy it was also um on the job training so even now in initially when we started we had a four-month induction training where you know people go out in the field but we realized that was too long and people needed to get going on interventions um, and so we actually incorporated more mentoring and on the job training um, to build up those core competencies and then again mapping and pre and post assessments during appraisals or also during um, recruitment will give you very very quickly um, a, a very good idea of where um, the program as a whole is lacking core competencies. Yeah, thanks. Um, I may just, again, really amplify that point that you're making about what the more targeted you get, the more likely you're going to be looking at um, kind of live in situ mentorship as these things show up in the actual workflow, whether it's an analytical, it's a partnership, it's a measurement like um, and, and that, you know, we started on that with the original framework. If, as you if you read the whole thing for each competency, there is a bit where we say, like, how would you mentor someone on this competency? It's not com comprehensive. I mean, some point getting more of these examples of what that looks like, we'd, we'd love to keep refreshing it. But I think that is the reality of the more targeted support work um, is about, yeah, being there day in, week out, debriefing, asking that person to try something, debriefing when they come back from the field, how it actually went. Um, wonderful. We've got um, a, a really interesting kind of thought process and the, and the question here from Merton. Merton, I think if we've got you live, if you want to just, yes, yeah, summarize the gist of your, of your idea. Um, yeah. And, Can you and hear the me? question. Yep. yep. Fire away. And hi guys. Uh, thanks a lot for the presentations. Uh, I, I've been in part of for some of these discussions, but I was just thinking, yeah, so we've been um, also thinking about how do we do this better in the ILO, you know, but we have all these rules, um, um, we don't define HR policies or, or contracting in this organization, obviously, nor learning nor anything. So, so my question to to all of you, one kind of maybe to Fernando, kind of how do we how do we deal with that? If you already have a very big bureaucracy that has defined all these contracting procedures, um, obviously there's some room leeway to to influence that. But um, and then maybe also to Nina and Paul, kind of. Um, when you implement the changes in your HR contracting and um, and recruitment and in training people, how did others react that might have had uh, views on how to do this prior to you changing them based on the competency framework? So I was just wondering about the internal, um, yeah, bottlenecks or whatever you you confronted there. Yeah. Thanks, thanks for that that question. Um, yeah, I'm kind of laughing inside because we also, you know, we also struggle in um, in terms of procurement as well. That's another area, but that's a whole another um, grab the mic. Um, for us, it actually doesn't impact on contracting. So it's more the processes of recruiting. If you actually look at the HR systems themselves, even if you're competency based, if even if you do a competency based, it usually fits within any um, normal HR system. It's just about whether or not you can get agreement to change um, the questions, for example, or to have not only interviews, but to have role plays or um, case based um, re recruitment processes. Um, for us, it was about lobbying and it was about um, really showing um, headquarters in a big organization um, the benefit of doing this. And um, it did take about four years. I don't know if all programs have that amount of time, um, but after, after four years, we did get um, um, HQ to, to change their mind. Um, Paul, did you want to add? Yeah, briefly, for us, the biggest challenge was to get people 
have a shared understanding of how we frame and select the right competencies. And that involved a lot of back and forth, getting people's views, incorporating them and showing that we are not bringing something from out there and that it clearly captures everything they are concerned about. And we had people who had whole frameworks that they had used elsewhere and they wanted to bring them wholesale. That, that was you know, a bit more challenging, but lots of back and forth and iteratively showing what you are saying, this is how we capture it here and it's pretty similar, yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, Merton, to your question, I think, I mean, having having led hiring process in ILO and having uh, having been applying to 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 processes in ILO uh, in in MSD project and, and stuff, I can say two things. I, th I think there's leeway, as you say. I think uh, we usually focus on technical uh, information and then competencies uh, defined by by the by the HR department. Uh, I think that the, the, the technical part in, in selection wise, I think if, from my perspective, we, we could do a better job also in, in having a, a bit of our, our own model in thinking, okay, so if the person is gonna do this, we want these competencies to be uh, measured. So let's ask a question in this in the exam and in, during the interview, let's ask this and that. And I think that's one. And then once the people are selected, I think also a way of doing this, I think it's um, the good thing about having a big organization also is that you have a, a lot of good examples, I think as well. So one way could be to, to, to have uh, secondments or mentorship programs that, that, as you say, yes, they are parallel to HR uh, structures, but I think it, it could be helpful also to develop specific competencies um, in, in colleagues as well, yeah. Yeah, uh, fantastic. We're we're just one minute to the hour, but um, it's been really nice to take this conversation. And and I forgot to mention at the beginning, back in twenty twenty one and twenty twenty two, the three panelists here, but also um, Merton and David at Prisma and, and another former colleague of Paul's, Judith. We we did meet several times to have these discussions. Like, so you're not just seeing. <laughs> kind of pure live, this is a group that's kind of had the kind of brain trust together to think about these challenges, offer tips and advice. And um, it's been fun to get to put that kind of out into the world uh, to the wider audience. So um, yeah, huge thank you to the panelists on stage and, and those behind the scenes. Um, it's fascinating to hear your examples and your insights. Um, clearly the BEAM framework is a work in progress, lots to be improved. And if you are using it and you wanna suggest changes, like please reach out to me and be happy to make them. Um, it's also not a finished product. I mean, I think part of the implicit message here is that it, you know, we're never gonna have the resources to specialize it in all of the different ways. So we're trying to build a good general set of building blocks that you can take and adapt and prioritize and structure. Um, so we're always trying to strike that balance. And I think Prisma, Gatsby, and the ILO have been fantastic to see how you're doing that, that tailoring work. So the last request for me to, to all the participants, if you can click on the on the Google form link that Isabel has popped in the chat, we're keen to get feedback on this as part of the Grab the Mic webinar series. Um, otherwise, thanks for your time and a, and a really engaging conversation and, and all the best in the rest of your day, or maybe it's time to, to head, head in if you're in Indonesia. Thank you.